Hello, my name is Carol Leibel, and today we're going to examine how materials cross the cell membrane. You've seen this illustration before. It's of a plasma membrane. And remember, the structure of a plasma membrane, it's composed of a bilayer of phospholipids. Inserted into that bilayer are proteins, kind of like a mosaic. So this is called the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane. In looking at this, you should be able to determine that this is indeed an animal cell and that there are, um, the reason it's an animal cell is because it has an extracellular matrix and there's also cholesterol inserted into the membrane. So the, so the mem cell membrane is said to be semi-permeable or selectively permeable because the membrane allows certain molecules to cross and prevents other molecules from coming into or exiting the cell. If a protein, by the way, is, is just on the outside, we call that an extrin extrinsic protein or a peripheral protein. If it's into the membrane or all the way through, then we call that an intrinsic protein. So the first type of transport we want to examine is called passive diffusion. And so in this illustration, we have two setups. We have an initial setup in which on side B, we have red molecules. And on side A and B, we have water molecules, and they're represented by the blue dots. Now, the red molecules are indeed permeable to the membrane. And we can see in the final setup is that the red molecules have moved, the net movement has been from side B to side A. And that's because on side B, initially, they are more concentrated. They are more organized. Another, in other words, we can say that the molecules on side B have more free energy. The movement of the molecules is going to be from an area of higher concentration, side B, to an area of lower concentration on side A. Another way we could say this in terms of free energy, they're going to move from a, an area of higher free energy to an area of lower free energy. Remember we say that this is a net movement because the molecules do indeed have the ability to move back. So the arrows should be, um, should be one large arrow, arrow from B to A and a smaller area, arrow from A to B. The water molecules are equally distributed on both sides. So they're going to move across the membrane at the same rate. So this is passive diffusion. And remember the key, the key points to this is that the molecules are indeed permeable, excuse me, the membrane is permeable to those molecules. And the molecules are going to move from an area of higher concentration or an area of more free energy to an area of lower concentration or lower free energy. So we're going to look at this little video that talks about passive diffusion or diffusion in general. Diffusion is the tendency for particles of any kind to spread out from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. This process can also be described as molecules moving down their concentration gradient. Diffusion across a biological membrane is called passive transport since the cell expends no energy to move the molecules. Oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules move into and out of cells by passive transport. I want to take a minute and talk about the difference between the terms passive transport and passive diffusion. Passive transport refers to any kind of transport across the membrane that does not use ATP. Passive diffusion refers to the movement of molecules across a membrane 
from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And the key here is that the membrane is permeable to those molecules. So if we're looking at this little, um, this little summary, if you will, in the case of passive diffusion, is the membrane permeable to the molecule? The answer is yes. Did we need a protein carrier? No, we did not. The direction of movement was from higher concentration to lower concentration, or higher free energy to lower free energy. Did we need ATP? No, we did not. Examples of molecules that can cross the membrane in this manner would include carbon dioxide, oxygen, and lipids. So what happens if we have a molecule that crosses the membrane, but it, the membrane is not permeable to that molecule? Well, in order for it to cross the membrane, we're going to need a protein carrier. And so think about the term facilitate. If you're going to facilitate something, you're going to direct or help make some kind of um, something happen. And so in facilitated diffusion, we're going to need a protein carrier. So the membrane is impermeable to the molecule. And the transport of the molecule is going to require a protein carrier or a channel protein. The molecules are going to go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So the driving force is an increase in the entropy, just like passive diffusion. All right, so we're looking here in, in this, um, the first example. We have a channel protein that the opening is is such so that this molecule can just fit into that opening. So the molecule is moving from a, hi, from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. As that little video said, it's going with its concentration gradient. Now, sometimes instead of using a channel protein, a carrier protein is required. And once the um, molecule attaches to the that carrier protein, it changes shape and allows the passage of the molecule from one side to the other side. But again, the driving force happens to be the higher concentration to the lower concentration. So that is facilitated diffusion. So um, here's a little animation. And we can see the molecules moving from higher concentration to lower concentration down a concentration gradient. One more time. And again, it's facilitated because we have to have a carrier molecule. So in looking at this, facilitated diffusion, is the membrane permeable to the molecule? The answer is no. So because of that, we need um, a facilitator, if you will, or a carrier molecule. The direction is also from high to low. Do we need ATP? No. Some examples that uh, use facilitated diffusion include glucose and certain amino acids. So now, passive diffusion and facilitated diffusion are both examples of passive transport because you did not need ATP to move the molecules. So what if you want to do ju um, just the opposite and you wanted to move the molecules against a concentration gradient? Kind of like trying to put perfume molecules back into a back into a bottle. Well, you know that's going to require some energy in the form of, it turns out, ATP. And so that is called active transport. So the membrane is impermeable to the molecules. The molecules are moving against a concentration gradient from low to high, from a low concentration to a high concentration, or from low free energy to high free energy. In order to make this system work, it's going to require a transport protein and ATP. So this was a little animation showing you that process. 
And here is the classic example of active transport, and it involves a sodium potassium pump. So it starts off in step one. In step one, we see that we have this protein carrier, and we see the, that the protein carrier is such that it attracts sodium ions, and it attracts three sodium ions. Once the sodium ions are attached to the protein carrier, it causes the protein carrier to change shape once it's been phosphorylated. Well, where in the world is it going to get that extra phosphate group? That extra phosphate group is going to come from ATP. So once the three sodium ions are attached and the phosphate is attached, the protein becomes unstable. And now this protein carrier is going to change shape. When it changes shape, it's going to favor the removal of the sodium ions. And in addition to that, it's going to cause that phosphate group to detach. Now, in this particular ch shape, it's going to favor the, the uptake or the binding of potassium ions, but only two potassium ions. When the two potassium ions attach, it causes the protein to become unstable in that particular shape. So now it returns to shape number one, and when it returns to shape number one, that favors the potassium ions to be removed, and now the whole process starts over again. And so it's like a little pump. The protein carrier is changing shape, or it's changing from conformation number one to conformation number two. So here's a little video that also illustrates the, the sodium-potassium pump. Sometimes a cell needs to move a solute against its concentration gradient. This process is called active transport, and it requires input of energy from ATP. For instance, most animal cells need to expel sodium ions, Na+, and take in potassium ions, K+, both against their concentration gradients. Here is how the sodium-potassium pump works. Sodium ions bind to a transport protein. ATP transfers a phosphate group to the protein, providing the energy that causes the protein to change shape and push the sodium ions across the membrane, where they are released outside the cell. Potassium ions now bind to the transport protein, and the phosphate group is released. This causes the protein to return to its original shape, releasing the potassium ions inside the cell. The transport protein is now ready to repeat the process. An electrogenetic pump is one that pumps ions against a concentration gradient, and in doing so, it causes a charge gradient to be created and a separation of charge across the membrane, if you will. So here we have a proton pump that uh, requires ATP. We're pumping out hydrogen ions so that this side of the membrane is becoming positive and this side is becoming negative. Sometimes an electrogenic pump is combined with another protein carrier that that now can be used to facilitate the transport of another molecule back into the cell. So in this example that they have, here is this protein pump. We're pumping out hydrogen ions. It's becoming positive. And now we have, um, we have another protein carrier that requires those hydrogen ions in order to move sucrose into the cell. So this is like a co-transporter um, protein carrier, if you will. So now looking at this summary of active transport, is the membrane permeable to the, the molecule? The answer is no. Did we need a protein carrier? The answer is yes. However, the direction we had to go against a concentration gradient. We were going from low concentration to high concentration, like putting perfume molecules back into the bottle. In order to do that, it required energy in the form of ATP. Things like ions and polar molecules will often need active transport to go across the membrane. 
And so now we want to look at the special case of osmosis. And so we're going to use some terminology. The first thing is a hypotonic solution. A hypotonic solution is one that has fewer molecules on one side of the membrane than the other solution. So if we're looking over here, what we see is we see fewer molecules that are dissolved into the water. And on the other side, we see a lot more molecules dissolved into the water. So that's said to be a hypertonic solution. So the question is, what's going to happen to this system? Because these molecules, the membrane, is not permeable to these, these molecules. But water is permeable to the membrane. So what happens is the water molecules are going to move from, and we're going to call this side A and this side B, side A and side B. The water molecules are going to move from side A to side B. And by doing so, once this, we have this final um, setup, if you will, what we see is now if we look in terms of concentration, the molecules are concentrated about the same on each side. And now we have reached equilibrium. In terms of the water molecules, initially over here on side A, the water molecules had more free energy because they were more organized, they were more concentrated. Over here on side B, the water molecules had less free energy because they were less con the water molecules were less concentrated. We're not talking about the molecules in solution. Okay? When you're talking about the molecules in solution, less concentrated over here, more concentrated. By the water molecules moving, what we see is we have reached equilibrium. The concentration on both sides of the membranes are about equal. And in doing so, we see the net movement of water has been from side A to side B. This movement of water across the membrane is called osmosis. So let's look at this little video about osmosis. The plasma membrane is permeable to water molecules and the movement of water into and out of cells is critical to life. Diffusion of water molecules across a selectively permeable membrane is a special kind of passive transport called osmosis. Plant cells are surrounded by rigid cell walls. When plant cells are exposed to hypotonic environments, water rushes into the cell and the cell swells, but is kept from breaking by the rigid wall layer. The pressure of the cell pushing against the wall makes the cell turgid and is the desired state for most plant tissues. For instance, placing a wilted celery stalk or lettuce leaf in a hypotonic environment of pure water will often revive the leaf by inducing turgor in the plant cells. Animal cells lack rigid cell walls. When they are exposed to hypotonic environments, water rushes into the cell and the cell swells. Eventually, if water is not removed from the cell, the pressure will exceed the tensile strength of the cell and it will burst open, or lies. Many single-celled protists living in freshwater environments have contractile vacuoles that pump water back out of the cell in order to maintain osmotic equilibrium and avoid lysis. Plant cells are surrounded by rigid cell walls. When plant cells are exposed to hypertonic environments, water rushes out of the cell, and the cell shrinks away from the rigid wall. These cells are dehydrated, and lose most or all physiological functions while in the shriveled state. If cells are returned to isotonic or hypotonic environments, water re-enters the cell and normal functioning may be restored. Animal cells lack rigid cell walls. When they are exposed to hypertonic environments, water rushes out of the cell and the cell shrinks. The resulting cells are dehydrated and lose most or all physiological functions while in the shriveled state. If the cells are returned to isotonic or hypotonic environments, water re-enters the cell and normal functioning may be restored. 
I want you to examine this situation. In this situation, on we're going to cl again call this side A and this side B and side A and side B. On side A, we have pure distilled water, and so therefore it's a hypotonic solution. On side B, we have a solution in which we have some dissolved solutes, but the solutes, but the membrane is not permeable to those solutes. So now, after time, you would expect the water to go, the net movement of water to go from side A to indeed side B. Okay, remember the net movement. My question to you is, why is it that not all the water goes from A to B? Because even in this situation right here, this is still a hypotonic solution. Why is it that all the water doesn't go from side A to side B? So take a moment and think about it. Hopefully you've come up with the solution that there's an opposing force pushing back and that opposing force is gravity. There's more water on side B and so that's going to push back with a greater force than side A. And so that is what's going to prevent all the water from side A from going entirely over to side B. So here I want you then to look at this summary of plant cells and animal cells. We have a situation in which we're going to put cells into a hypotonic solution. Think of it as pure distilled water. So there are more solutes inside the cell than outside the cell. The net movement of the water is going to be into the cell. If it's a plant cell, that cell is not going to pop, but instead what's going to happen is it's going to become turgid. And that's because there's a force pushing back. And that force pushing back is indeed the cell wall. So there's a, a pressure gradient, if you will, and that's going to prevent it from lysing. However, the animal cell only has the plasma membrane, which is not very strong, and so there's not enough pressure to push back and the cell will lyse. This is why when you are dehydrated and you need, um, you can't drink any water, and perhaps you're passed out, they give you an IV in which the, uh, the liquid is isotonic to the cell. So if you put cells into an isotonic solution in which the solutes inside the cell equal that to what's outside the cell, you're going to have an equal movement of water into and out of both cells. Okay. Now in a hypertonic solution, in a hypertonic solution, think of these cells being placed into something like k syrup and that there are more solutes, excuse me, silly me, there's more solutes outside the cell than inside the cell. And so the net movement of water is of course going to be to the outside of the cell. And so if you're an animal cell, the cell will shrivel. If you are a plant cell, the cell is going to pull away from the cell wall and that process is called plasmolysis. You can restore those cells by putting them or submerging them into an isotonic solution. All right, so now here is um, here's a little video showing you plasmolysis. You can start to see that the plasma membrane is starting to pull away from the cell, those chloroplasts are moving towards the center of the cell.
So plasmolysis has occurred. So let's talk about a summary then of osmosis. Is the membrane permeable to the molecules? If you are talking about the solutes, the answer is no. But if you're referring to water, if you're talking about water, the answer is yes. Do you need a carrier molecule? For osmosis, uh, there's a mistake there. The answer is no. Remember, in terms of how is the water going to move, the answer is water likes to dilute. Do you need ATP? Nope. And an example is that water is moving across the membrane. So the last type of transport across the membrane is endocytosis and exocytosis. And in order for these larger molecules to move across the membrane, you're going to need little membrane vesicles. So endocytosis is the movement of larger particles into the cell by the use of these membrane vesicles. There are three types of endocytosis. There's phagocytosis, which is often called cell eating. There's penocytosis, which is often called cell drinking. And there's receptor-mediated endocytosis. So let's look at a little video about endo endocytosis in general. Endocytosis is the movement of materials into a cell via membranous vesicles. Exocytosis is the movement of materials out of a cell via membranous vesicles. These processes allow patches of membrane to flow from compartment to compartment, reminding us that a cell is a dynamic structure. So remember, phagocytosis is cell eating, where larger molecules or particles are brought into the cell by engulfing them into a plasma membrane vesicle. So let's watch a little animation about it. In endocytosis, membranes invaginate, or pinch in, to form a vesicle, moving the enclosed materials inside the cell. This process can take different forms, each involving its own specific cell machinery. In phagocytosis, or cell eating, the cell engulfs debris, bacteria, or other sizable objects. Phagocytosis occurs in specialized cells called phagocytes, which include macrophages, neutrophils, and other white blood cells. Invagination produces a vacuole, which usually fuses with one or more lysosomes containing hydrolytic enzymes. Materials in the vacuole are broken down by these enzymes and degraded. So just to point out, uh, the video was talking about um, phagocytes and white blood cells. And if you've ever had a little cut and there's that white pussy material, actually those are phagocytes that have literally eaten themselves to death in defense of your body. They've eaten so much they have bursted open. All right, well, so much for that little gross thing. Let's go on to, um, here is a little actual video looking at yeast cells undergoing the process of phagocytosis. So they're engulfing things, particles, that I'm assuming is some sort of food for them. So moving on to penocytosis. Penocytosis is called cell drinking. And the difference is, is that the material that's being brought into the cell is dissolved into some liquid. Kind of like mm, drinking Kool-Aid, sort of, is how I like to think of it. So let's watch this little bit. In pinocytosis, or cell drinking, the cell engulfs extracellular fluid, including molecules such as sugars and proteins. These materials enter the cell inside a vesicle. Epithelial cells in capillaries use pinocytosis to engulf the liquid portion of blood at the capillary surface. The resulting vesicles travel across the capillary cells and release their contents to surrounding tissues, while blood cells remain in the blood. And last but not least, we want to talk about receptor-mediated endocytosis. And this is kind of cool. 
Unlike phagocytosis and pinocytosis, receptor-mediated endocytosis is very specific. It is triggered when membrane receptors bind to specific external molecules, such as protein cholesterol complexes or proteins bound to iron. Membrane vesicles pinch off and the external protein and its cargo are brought into the cell. Just a note about receptor-mediated endocytosis, that is a way that your body regulates cholesterol. If you are a person that is missing some of those receptor sites, you are susceptible to high cholesterol levels. And unfortunately, it's not unusual for people who have such a defect that they have a heart attack at the age of 40 or younger. So next we want to talk about exocytosis. Exocytosis is just the opposite of endocytosis. Material that needs to be sec secreted moves through the compartments of the Golgi apparatus and then it is wrapped up into a vesicle and then after that it is um, it moves to the plasma membrane where it is excreted. So let's watch a little video about that. Exocytosis is the movement of intracellular vesicles to the plasma membrane, where they fuse with the membrane and release their contents into the surrounding fluid. This process occurs predominantly in secretory cells, such as mucus-producing cells or pancreatic cells, that secrete enzymes into the digestive tract. So this is a nice review of endocytosis. There are three types. There's phagocytosis, in which there are large particles that are being engulfed. There's pino or pinocytosis, in which dissolved materials are coming into the cell. And then there's receptor-mediated um, endocytosis. All three of these are bringing things into the cell. And so when we are looking at um, a summary, remember there's a mistake here. This should be, excuse me, let's go back. There's a mistake right here. This should be, no. Um, this is a summary of how things are able to cross the membrane. One of the things you should be able to do is you should be able to fill out this sheet and use it, enable, and use it to... Uh, write an essay or use it to answer multiple choice questions on your AP exam. So in summary, that's how things cross the membrane. And I hope you um, learned lots of wonderful things and we'll see you next time and you have a great day and I hope you get a five on your AP exam. Bye!